All right, so we're moving to another silver company here. Uh, the name is Reina Silver. It's a $30 million market cap company. Um, their primary silver project is in Mexico, but they also have a project in uh, Nevada as well as in Canada. Ticket symbol is RSLV uh, over on the Ventures Exchange, and in Frankfurt, their ticket symbol is 4ZC. So I am going to give it away to Lauren. All righty, good morning, everyone, and thank you for coming. Uh, particularly, thank you to Deutsche Goldmess for creating an opportunity for us to speak with you guys today about Reina Silver. Uh, my name is Lauren McGaw, and my job is essentially to translate geologist into English. Um, I'm lucky that I grew up bilingual, thanks to my father, Dr. Peter McGaw, um, and I'll do my best to sort of do this translation, though I realize that after learning the word cookie, I learned the word silver, so, you know, or CRD. Um, so I'll do my best job I can. And, you know, one of the big things with Reina Silver is that our goal is to go after the same kind of deposit that made Mag Silver so successful. High grade, big scale, and doing that through what we call an ore systems approach. So we're not looking to find the little piece that was left behind. We're looking for the next big portion of the district, or we're looking for a whole new district in terms of how we're exploring. Uh, obviously, we're going to make forward-looking statements. You guys all know it's important to do your own research and use that to determine your investments. We have four projects that fit through our filter of high grade and district scale. And we've got an exploration team that has been serially successful in applying that ore systems approach to exploration. And that is what has given us the strong support, along with our CEO, Jorge Ramirez Monroy, putting together a well-balanced investor register. And that has allowed us to have access to capital, which has allowed us to move forward all four of the projects. So to get a little detail on the projects and some Context, we've got two projects in Mexico, Batapilas and Gigi. Batapilas is historically native, is historically Mexico's highest grade silver district. It's actually a native silver district. And what we've done there is we've gone in as the silver exploration company, and not only we've found more high grade silver, but we also found gold. And we've done a big rethink, and I look forward to telling you about what we've discovered there so far. The other three projects are what we refer to as carbonate replacement deposits. And you've been hearing about these more and more since South 32 with Taylor Hermosa and picking up that project for 1.2 billion. But you're also hearing it with success stories from places like Western Alaska and WAM potentially yesterday. And one of the reasons why we like carbonate replacement deposits is because they're big and they'd be very high grade, and they're continuous systems. And if we take that ore systems approach and we look at the full continuum, the potential additional blue sky effects, looking at the sources of these things where sometimes they're porphyries and sometimes they're productive, it's particularly interesting, both in terms of an exploration vector and in terms of potential upside. So we've got Gigi, which is at the heart of the Santo Lalia mining district, uh, which is one of the world's largest carbonate replacement deposits. And what we know from studying CRDs there and CRDs worldwide, it's just half the system produced a billion ounces, or half a billion ounces, excuse me. We're looking for the other half. Uh, the other two are in Nevada. You have Medicine Springs, where we think the full carbonate replacement deposit is intact. And then we have our new acquisition, which is called Griffin Summit. And Griffin Summit, we have gold, silver and critical metals too. So there's a Carlin component, there's a CRD component, and then there's a strata bound critical metals component. And we love acquiring this project. It's the case of, in this, this spot of the market, that's when the truly great projects pop loose. And we're excited to see the opportunity, particularly because it comes with a tremendous amount of data that we now get to sink our own teeth into and apply our expertise into how we're looking at it. Um, I only have so much time, so I'm not gonna go fully into here, but essentially what this slide tells you is we've made big progress on all four projects. We found gold at Botapilis, we rethought the district, we're finding more high-grade silver. At Gigi, we're zeroing in on the source. Uh, we're actually now working with a group out of Stanford who's doing AI application of optimization of geophysics and drill hole trajectory because we want to apply the cutting edge and then at Medicine Springs, we got a combination of 
drilling that has told us we're dealing with a very potent system. But in addition to that, we've got geophysics that is aligning with our structural as well as our sampling work, suggesting that we potentially have the source of the system there as well. And that could be a, a, a target for next year. And then at Griffin, we have all that um, significant data for us to pull it together and that will launch our 2024 uh, exploration campaign. Uh, Jorge Ramiro Monroy is our CEO. He's over here. He's uh, Seriously, he's successful in the uh, capital market side. We also have a strong exploration team. One thing that I would note is that because Gigi and Botapilas came from Mag Silver, uh, we get 15% of my father's time. In addition to that, two of our geologists, Rene Ramirez and Manuel Ruiz, have been alongside him for his major discoveries at Cinco de Mayo, or at, Cinco de Mayo at Juan Escipio, and at Platosa. So in some ways, you can think the boys are back together. And that's where we're able to take this 30 million market cap company. We have 150 million shares outstanding, a daily average volume of 250,000. And uh, the cash position before the two drilling programs of the summer was 5.4 million Canadian. One of the things I would point out is that we've got strong institutional coverage or strong institutional shareholders at this point, and we are gaining uh, coverage as well. And I look and I suggest that you look into that. So dropping into the fun part, the projects. So we've got Botapilas. This is the native silver district in Chihuahua. Um, that photo is one month production in 1906. That's not an exceptional month. That just happened to be when the photographer was there. That's 350,000 ounces of fine silver. And it did that, the main ore mineral there was native silver, and it did that for 300 million ounces. So what you see there on the left, that is a native silver specimen. Uh, they tended to be uglier when they were putting them into the crusher, heating them up a little bit, and boom, you were able to pour those into coins. Crazy high grade, when they were in the ore chutes proper, the grade was actually up to averaging 2% when they were in the native silver cores. So these things went from these tight structures to the course of three to five meters, they balloon out, the full structure would be three to eight meters wide, uh, with a native silver core of half a meter to two meters, 30 to 80 meters on level, and went down for hundreds, 250 to 500 meters down. And at the core of that is where you're dealing with that 2% silver, which is 20,000 grams per ton. So what we did is we said, let's get out of the historic center of gravity in this district. Let's go and follow structures up into the Northeast. And when we did that, we found gold. And we did a rethink of this district because when you're finding mineable widths and grades of gold, you should figure out how it fits into the overall framework. And we did structural work, we did geophysics, and we did sampling. And when we did that, it came up with a series of anomalies that we decided to test. And we did that in an area that we felt we were setting ourselves up for the highest chance of success. So we drilled between the Escritorio and the Todos los Santos vein. And what that essentially boils down to is we hit a new native silver vein. It's not the big ore shoot blowout, but it is the type of feature that tells us you're getting very close from historical data that we're able to work our way through. The other component is that hole 58, starting just three meters from surface, we encountered over thir uh, just three meters from surface, we encountered over thir uh, 30 meters of silver mineralization with nine meters of over 600 gram silver, which is showing us that if things did not crop out on surface, the potential for finding more mineralization at Botapilis is more than there. So we're excited to move this one forward and see just how much bigger it is. The other projects we have are carbonate replacement deposits. So I'm gonna take a moment and kind of spend a little time explaining CRDs in terms of how we approach them. So that big pink blob that you see there, that's your intrusive, that's your source of the system. It could be a porphyry. That could be a economically productive porphyry or an economically barren porphyry. Coming off that is acidic mineralized fluid. That fluid finds its way into fractures or routes in the, mineral, in the, the rock. When it comes into contact with the carbonate, hence the carbonate replacement deposit, you get this reaction. It's an acid-based reaction. The pH changes and the metals drop out. So now that I've used enough big fancy words that you think I know what I'm talking about, I'm going to try to now translate this into English. So if you think about this like a public transportation system, and I realize this makes a little bit better sense if you're in Europe than if you live in like New York City, 
um, you have your source. And your source is like your bus terminal. That's the same as that porphyry. And coming off of it is your acidic mineralized fluid. And different elements are getting off along the bus at different places. So close to that terminal, you have your downtown area. That's your proximal scar. So higher copper, gold, lead, zinc, a little bit lower grade silver, but it's voluminous. As you make your way out into the suburbs, your grade goes way up on the silver, lead, zinc, things tighten up. And then at the very end, the elements that fell asleep on the back of the bus get kicked off. And those are your trace elements. The reason this is important is that when you're drilling, you can identify and vector your way through the system by, by figuring out where you are. So when you drill into the suburbs, you go, oh, here's where I am. Or if you can identify where the source is, you can work those against the distal portion of the system and work those towards the middle. And the idea is that you've got this full continuum that you're able to function with. And that's important for something like our Gigi project, which produced half a billion ounces of silver. And it did that from two suburbs. Our question is, where is the source? So that downtown area and that bus terminal have yet to be found. We have extensive work, including my father's PhD thesis, on the historic workings. And the idea is you work those two ends against the middle, find the bigger mineralization. And you can, one of the reasons to do that is because as you make your way closer to the source, the mineralization is larger and more voluminous, and it makes it easier to work your way out or from inside out. In addition to that, we have our Medicine Springs project in Nevada. Of the 13 key features that are associated with the big, high-grade CRDs, we see 11 out of the 13 already. Essentially, you have to have the bus terminal, you have to have the source rock, it's magic, and you have to have high grade. The rest of these features tell you that the bus left the terminal many times fully loaded. So far, the system is telling us that we have significant mineralization. Of the nine structures that we've intersected, seven have carried high grade silver mineralization. And on top of that, what we've now discovered is a geophysics anomaly that's associated with the structural and copper anomalies, which is what you would see as you're moving closer to the source. Our first holes told us, yeah, it's got plenty room to grow with an almost 800 meter hole being almost entirely carbonate, which is good. And we're also seeing high grade right off the bat. Um, in addition to that, we've got these big geophysics anomalies that we're currently working with. Uh, we'll be applying that AI program there uh, to really refine those targets. And if that wasn't enough, we also have Griffin. And Griffin is a combination gold, silver, and critical metals project. It's over 10,000 hectares. It's a joint venture with our sister company, Raina Silver. And here what you have is an example of when you're in between two of the world's largest gold mega districts. Carlin and Battle Mountain Eureka, the focus on this project historically has been gold with the blinders on. Despite the fact that if you look at this thing from a CRD perspective, of the 13 key features during our due diligence process, we see eight that suggest this is a strong carbonate replacement deposit, including silver, lead, zinc numbers, and on top of that, we still have the gold component and a copper component as well. So we get to take the 39 kilometers of IP, the 17 kilometers of CSAMT and NSAMT, the GRAV, the MAG, the hyperspectral. We get to go through the 23 core holes. I actually, the team, including my father, will be re-logging all t over 12,000 meters of core. Looking at it from the CRD perspective, because there are vectors that we pay attention to that aren't the ones that Carlin geologists typically pay attention to. And we get to essentially take this incredible data set and leverage it to hopefully make another CRD discovery and uh, take a whack at uh, Griffin as well. I realize I have a minute and there are assuredly questions. So if anyone's any, got any questions, comments, or jokes. Uh, I've got one. Are you guys asking for arsenic down in Mexico? Yes. We do a 41 element assay. Okay, so how, how's, this, how's the arsenic levels coming up? 
Um, it depends on which, so at Botapilis, you're dealing with a low arsenic system because the mineralization is primarily uh, that native silver. Uh, though there is a component with the recent uh, 30 meters where we're seeing increased levels of arsenic, which is a trace element to us, but not in terms of like, uh, it's, it's, the levels are not the same as what you would see in like a carlin or like a high arsenic situation. Like we're not dealing with like arsenopyrite. Right. And anything else in terms of deleterious elements, mercury, something else that you can tell me about? So, you know, there can be deleterious elements relative to any of these systems because they're trace elements, uh, they're volatiles. Uh, but one of the things that's nice about particularly the carbonate replacement deposits is that they are metallurgically docile. So in part, things are easy to pull. Uh, the metallurgy is relatively simple. Um, and you get good recovery rates. And on top of that, you do end up with some rare elements, um, but that's part of the process. Right, um, okay. And then what did you have, five, five and a half million dollars in cash, something like that? Uh, we had five and a half million dollars in cash prior to the drilling campaigns at Botapilis and uh, Medicine Springs this summer. How far, oh, so, but they, they're fully funded. Does it get you beyond those programs? Uh, so we finished those two programs. Oh, okay, uh, so how far so, does the five and a half million get you? At some point, we're going to have to do a raise. We're a junior company. Um, that's an important part of the consideration. Um, we'll be looking towards drilling Griffin. And one of the things that we're looking at is to make sure that we have multiple game plans so that we can determine an optimized drilling campaign or campaigns at our projects relative to the market conditions. Got it. Thank you, Lauren. Any other questions? So part of it has been because after the raise, there was a four month, uh, one, there was a four month lockup. Then after that we had material information and then after that we had material information that we were drilling um, on the two projects. Basically, management has been on blackout. For the whole year? Pretty much, from, since February. Okay. As a result of the financing, the, the bank who led our financing asked us uh, for a four month we couldn't buy or sell. And then once we started drilling and receiving material information, uh, we just put out our, our last uh, press release with material information a, a couple of weeks ago. So, uh, so it, when, uh, when did, does that end? That it's, it's finished now. Okay, so so I'll, I'll go and buy some. <laughs> okay. But, but that, that, that's the reason we uh, yeah. basically the material yeah. information. So the moment it is uh, supporting for the exchange. Yeah. So I pass it off to, to Doug with Defiance next? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you so much. Appreciate it, and thank you, everyone. <laughs>